This is the fourth Sunday of Lent, the epistles taken from St. Paul's letter to the Catholics in Galatia. Chapter 4. Brethren, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a slave woman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but he of the free woman was, was by promise. Which things are said by an allegory. For these are the two testaments, the one from Mount Sinai, engendering into, unto slavery, which is Agar. For Sinai is a mountain in Arabia, which hath affinity to that Jerusalem which now is, and is in slavery with her children. But that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for many are the children of the desolate more than of her that has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born according to the flesh persecuted him that was after the Spirit, so also it is now. But what says the Holy Scripture? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman <clears throat> shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the slave woman, but of the free, by the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. John chapter 6. At that time, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is that of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus therefore went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the past the festival day of the Jews was near at hand. When Jesus therefore had lifted up his eyes and saw that a very great multitude cometh to him, he said to Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to try him, <clears throat> for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that everyone may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, says to him, There is a boy here that has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in that place. The men therefore sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them that were set down, in like manner also of the fish, as much as they would eat. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, lest they be lost. They gathered up therefore and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Now those men when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done said this is of a truth the prophet that is to come into the world. Jesus therefore when he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him king, fled again into the mountain, himself alone. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. <clears throat> so later today I'll have a mass in St. Catharines, Ontario and then tonight in Syracuse, New York. And here in Toronto, <clears throat> a 
I encourage you to uh, continue. As Archbishop Lefebvre always used to say, we continue. We continue the doctrine of the popes of tradition. We continue the mass of all time. We continue the doctrine, the catechism, the sacraments, the sacred scripture of tradition. And these things will triumph over all the deceits and plots of the enemies of Christ. We just have to pray to be faithful, pray to endure the cold winter, to endure the heat of this battle to the end. So we uh, continue to pray every day the Holy Rosary, as Our Lady asked, to sanctify your souls, to, uh, especially for the men, to work for the kingship of Christ. And a good way to do this, aside from, I know many of you are third order Franciscans, <clears throat> which is a great path of many, many saints. St. Louis IX was a third order Franciscan. And I encourage you also to uh, consider the League of Christ the King, which is uh, the president of it is Hugh Akins. And uh, his website is Catholic Resource. No, Catholic Action Resource Center, if you can remember that, Catholic Action Resource Center. And uh, he has a very good booklet going out. He's totally with the Society of the Tenth Marian Corps, the resistance throughout the world. And he's rallying all the men to, to work together to study the papal encyclicals. And this is something you also could do, certainly the men, um, however way you want to organize it, over a beer and chips whatever, but to study the papal encyclicals, <clears throat> to reconvert our minds, which have been so contaminated by the modern liberalism, modern democracy, the Judeo-Masonic press, and the media. We are all, we're all affected by this, and we're all poisoned with the liberal ideas. And we have to recover some Catholic sanity. And before you build you got to have the right blueprints, you got to have the right plans and uh, to rebuild the social kingship of Christ insofar as we can, insofar as we cooperate with the Virgin Mary to bring about her triumph <coughs> we must do our part, we must row the boats as Father Pfeiffer mentioned in his sermon last time, the apostles kept rowing that is we have to do what we can and uh, so I encourage you to consider the League of Christ the King. There's no great commitments except your Catholic baptism and your confirmation. But to, uh, to pull together, to form a core of men who will be completely devoted, dedicated towards our confirmation, which is to be soldiers of Jesus Christ the King. So uh, Hugh Akins, you can contact him. He is republishing the forbidden books now, the books that are no longer being sold in many of the Society of St. Pius X bookstores, and books that are now banned from most of the Society of St. Pius X new SSPX seminaries. And what are these works? The great works of Father Dennis Fahey. Father Dennis Fahey, the great Irish priest who was taught by Father Le Floch, in the French seminary in Rome 13 years before Archbishop Lefebvre. Same professor, same seminary, same order, the Holy Ghost Fathers, and same fight, the social reign of Christ the King. And uh, Father Dennis Fahey, he's a great, great priest. Everything he writes is, is well documented and well backed up. And he exposes the whole Judeo-Masonic control of the finances, of the World Banks, of the One World Order. He exposes even the, their plot to de, to de, to de nutri, nutri, nutri the foods, the white flour, and the, the whole plan of the foods to be uh, basically poisoned, to poison the, the, the population, to keep the pharmacies in business and the mortuaries in business. <laughs> so, Father Dennis Fay, uh, he, he deals with very concrete questions, economics and politics. But, all right, this may not be the domain for the women. God has made the women to love and 
and take care of the children and their grandchildren and take care of what's of the home and to serve. This is the glory of women, to serve in uh, to their, their fellow neighbor. But it is for the men to lead. In the men, you must be heads of your family, yes. You must govern your family, yes. You must lead the prayers in your family, yes. But the man is the link between the woman and his, the children to society, to the rest of the world. And that's where the men have to, it's the men that have to work to rebuild the social order to Christ the King. And of course, we're like, we're like the Israelites in the time of Judith, completely surrounded by the enemies. And um, even most traditional Catholics don't know the doctrine of the church on the kingship of Christ. But we got to start somewhere, and that is, you got to know it, you got to study. And so I encourage you men to form a core to study these great things and uh, to discuss them and as far as possible work practically for them. And Archbishop Lefebvre, if you remember, he told the French men in France, you're not allowed to let your country be overcome by communism. And the men he was telling them to fight. And it's interesting uh, I, know, I know a group of men <clears throat> in Quebec and they, uh, they pull together every Sunday when they don't have Mass, they pull together to study the encyclicals and they listen to the sermons of Archbishop Lefebvre. <coughs> of course, they speak French and the, the sermons are in French in his conferences. But it is, I'll make this one point which is significant. Uh, they have the old recordings of Archbishop Lefebvre and the new recordings that are being published out of, under the direction of the new SSPX in Menzingen coming out of Econ, <coughs> they, they have discovered that there are many parts that are deleted and the parts that are deleted in the new releases is everything that, a lot of it, which pertains to the men, the laymen and what they can do to reestablish the social kingship of Christ. All those things have been deleted. It's curious, isn't it? But that is where the, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where the concrete grows solid, is when men start working towards the social kingship of Christ, when things start building that way, the enemies get scared. They do not want to see public action towards concrete building for the social reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. They fear that. They fear that. And yet, that's where the men have to be guided by the popes of tradition, by the priests, to work towards this goal. How are we going to do it? What must we do? Well, we know Our Lady gave us the basic structure. Prayer and penance. But you must also study your mind, fill your minds, and convert our minds to what, what we're supposed to think on the questions of economics and politics. Because these have everything to do with the Catholic faith in Christ the King. We moderns separate politics from Christ the King. We separate economics from politics. We're all disjointed. And we're all divorced and cut up to pieces and categorized. But that's not, that's not reality. And look at the enemies of Christ. They have a one vision, a one world order, one world government, politics, economics, and the whole press supporting their one cause, which is the reign of the Antichrist and the overthrow of Christ the King. They're very united and they're very uh, coordinated. By we liberal Catholics, we're so disjointed. We, we, we get people that are upset who say, oh, Father was talking politics in the pulpit. Well, politics has everything to do with Christ the King. And it's the duty of the priest to tell the politicians what they must do to be good leaders and to lead souls to heaven. And that's why these Catholic bishops, cowards that they are, and jellyfish that they are all over the West, they should be unleashing excommunications on these Catholic politicians left and right. 
They should be speaking out against these Catholic politicians in the United States who are allowing abortion laws and divorce laws. But they're silent. Why? Why are they silent? What has happened to their heads? And you know what it is, as well as I. Vatican II. Vatican II attacks Jesus Christ as king. It attacks him as high priest. Eternal high priest. It attacks him as God. This is why our fight is so serious. And this is why what Bishop Follet is doing is so grave. He is betraying the cause. He is betraying the fight of all the popes, of Archbishop Lefebvre, of Father Dennis Fay, and of all the faithful sons of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Virgin Mother. And uh, Garcia Moreno, for example, the great president of Ecuador, foretold by the Virgin Mary. That's the program that our men need to follow and our leaders need to follow. He implemented the papal encyclicals on wheels. He put it on concrete pavement. And he, he implemented reviving the guilds of the Middle Ages. He, uh, Salazar of Portugal, another great Catholic leader, he formed corporations, which was similar to the guilds of the Middle Ages, which was the working men pulled together and form a Catholic corporation or guild. And where they can take the young people in, teach these people, the young people who are lost and going through these modern rotten schools, coming out with rotten heads and not knowing why they're on earth and believing that their great ancestors were apes hanging from trees. This is modern education. But the old corporations that, that these great Catholic presidents tried to revive was, for example, medical doctors who would pull together and nurses and take the girls and form them in how to be good nurses and take the young men to be good doctors and train them and they could work with them and, and learn the art of medicine or, or in the realm of carpentry or plumbing or in the realm of engineering. And this gave a future for the young and the young who would be married and have families they would have some Catholic body to be associated with like a guild or a corporation where they keep their faith and they look after one another and if one of them has a house burned down well they pull together and build a new one the Amish the Amish these are Protestants and they do this they do this. And we Catholics were so liberal and disjointed and so messed up that we got to start somewhere. And this is a good time. You know why? Because the West is fast collapsing. The West is falling apart. The West is committing suicide and self-extinction by all the contraception, by NFP, by abortion, by all the liberalism which drips with blood, as, as Bishop Williamson, <laughs> that's his coined phrase, and he's absolutely right. Liberalism drips with blood. We're killing ourselves as a nation. <clears throat> and as, as Catholics, we're, we're, we're so, we know that humanly speaking, it's helpless. But we also know the victory of Our Lady is near. And we also know that we can't just sit and twiddle our thumbs. Of course, you're all busy in your own way. You're all busy in your own states of life. There's no doubt about that. But it is obligatory by your confirmation, especially you men, to at least pull together, form cores of the League of Christ the King, to straighten out our heads, at least. To start thinking as Catholics, at least. And then from there, you can start planning and see where the, what to do to build, to reorder society back to Christ the King. I know this sounds, <laughs> it sounds almost impossible. Who are we, a small remnant, up against this whole Judeo-Masonic world creation, uh, this huge global force, we're nothing. 
But God doesn't need much. With an army of 300, Gideon conquered an army of over 10,000. And even in modern times, about 90, 80 years ago, the Cristeros in Mexico, 300 soldiers. That's what they started with, up against 12,000 men. And Our Lady stepped in, and they won. They won many battles. So, it, we, we must... The Catholic way is very simple. It's summed up in the great words of sacred scripture. We must fight with the sword in one hand. That is, fight for the faith. Defend the faith. Spread the faith. Of course, we don't, Catholics don't spread the faith with the sword, usually. They don't spread the faith with the sword. It's by preaching the truth and good example. The Catholic state may use the sword. The Catholic state may use force to repress false religions from building their temples and spreading their nonsense on the media. The Catholic state has every right to do that and must do that for the protecting of the sheep. This is Catholic doctrine. So the sword, as Catholics, we must fight with the sword and we must build with the trowel. And what is that building? It is the daily life, the concrete application of the Catholic principles to our daily life. And that means the men take care of the women. Men take care of your wives. And you wives give the faith and the world to your children and virtue, the love of virtue and goodness and beauty, which God is, which the Catholic faith is. And the men, we must give uh, our young, we must look after our young. How many of, of our, how many of our traditional Catholic families are losing their young to the world? And because the world has all the structures, and we Catholics we've got to work to give our young the right structures, the social settings, and the education, and the corporations or the guilds, whatever you want to call it, that will give them some some stability for, the, for their future and for uh, keeping their faith. And I know this is a, a, such a long-term goal, but again and again and again, we got to start somewhere. And the good, good place to start is start studying the papal encyclicals, the writings of these champions of Christ the King, Archbishop Lefebvre, Bishop de Castro-Mayer, Father Fahey, the, all the reprints of, with which Hugh Akins is doing. These are tremendous things. And uh, when the West is falling ap apart, when the West is collapsing, which it is, and maybe very soon to be punished severely by God uh, in some way, still we must build. We must fight with the sword in one hand, build with the trowel in the other. That's just how it goes. And we look at history, what did the Catholics do in history? During the ten severe Roman persecutions. Study that history, it's very interesting because it's very similar to our time. The, Rome, the martyrs of the Colosseum. And in would come some emperor, he would declare the uh, <coughs> arresting and putting to death of thousands of Catholic people. And then there would be a period of peace. There would be an emperor who would lighten the load and no longer persecute the Catholic people. So what did the Catholic people do? Did they twiddle their thumbs and wait till the next persecution? No, they pulled together, they started building churches. And then another emperor would come and knock them all down, put them to death. And then there'd be another relief. And they would start building again and building again and forming monasteries, and the families sending their children to the monks, and the monks having to flee in exile many times, and so forth. This is, our, this is how it is. Catholics just keep building. They keep going forward because we believe in the redemption. We believe in the Catholic reality that Christ must be king, yes, in heaven, but and also on earth. We say this every day. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. Which means God doesn't will heresies and false religions. He wills the truth. And he wills the triumph of his, 
of his redemption to save souls from hell. And that means concretely a social order that helps Catholics and people, all people, keep the state of grace. And only the Catholic religion has the right to be spread publicly because it's the only truth. The false religions don't have the right to spread and be publicly spread. They do not have that right because they are false. They're founded by false men who started false religions and there's nothing supernatural about these false religions. And that's why Pope Leo XIII, Pope St. Pius X, Pope Pius XI, all of them unanimously say <clears throat> the state has the duty to know, recognize, and defend and protect the true religion. There is not five true religions. There's only one. And the blessings that come from the true religion speak for themselves. Just look at marriage. The vows of marriage. When, when people live their vows and stay faithful to their vows, this holds society together. This holds all the children that come. It gives them a family. While so many divorces now, the poor kids are lost. Lost. And just that very fact of the Catholic teaching on marriage has such an impact on society. And the Catholic teaching of <clears throat> charity and justice. Put that in the nursing field and in the medical field. That condemns euthanasia. That condemns abortion. That condemns uh, genetics. The, the abuse of, ch of embryos of children. That is completely forbidden by the natural law, let alone the divine law. To use babies in their first weeks as uh, instruments like guinea pigs, it's awful. But this is now the norm. So you see how the Catholic faith so brings such benefits, such blessings, such happiness. And the teaching of charity towards your neighbor, the forgiveness of, of our enemies, to do good to our enemies. This is Catholic doctrine. And how this totally transforms society, even economics, even the political realm. And this is why the, we don't have to invent something new. We are Roman Catholics. We have a whole history of Christendom, of great knights who fought for the reign of Christ the King in the great crusades. We have great statesmen and kings and queens. We have great laymen and saints from all walks of life. The blueprints, we don't need to be revolutionaries based on the principles of the modern world, the French Revolution and Vatican II. We don't need to be innovators. We don't need to be dreamers of building some society that just cannot exist like communism, doing away with all poverty. Christ said, the poor will always be with you. And though those who have more must take care of them, and the, and the poor must not be jealous and stir revolution against the rich. There must be charity between them. And St. John Chrysostom in his day would get on the rich, and, every, and even in the Mass, publicly rebuke them for neglecting the poor. And so, you see the Catholic, we don't have to reinvent anything new, like St. Pius X said, we don't need to reinvent the Catholic city. It's already been built. We just have to take those blueprints and reapply them. And the, the heart of it is all, as Archbishop Lefebvre so often preached about, so clearly understood. The heart of Catholic society, and, and when I say Catholic society, all society, all men, is, is Christ. Everything must be reordered to Christ. And the heart of it is his staying with us in the Mass. The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass is built on the faith. You must have the right doctrine. And that's why the doctrinal fight is first now. To defend the true doctrine. That is our first duty now. And from that flows the true Mass. But it's on this truth, which Christ is, Christ is the true doctrine. He is the truth. He is that mass. And he is the cornerstone on which 
the whole political and social systems must be rebuilt. And this is a good time to spread this to people. Because even pagans are saying the West is collapsing. Even the pagans out there sense it's fallen to pieces. And it is. It's bound to. Did the George Washington and the Founding Fathers build on the kingship of Christ in the United States? Absolutely not. They didn't want Christ the King. They were Freemasons who are vowed to fight against Christ the King and the Catholic social order. That's why they have such a hatred of monarchy, which is the best Catholic system. It is the best Catholic system because you have one leader that leads to one end. But that doesn't mean he's a tyrant. He's got, a, he's got a, like a senate. He's got, a, he's got his counselors like, like St. Louis IX had. And he couldn't just throw arbitrary laws and arbitrary kill someone he doesn't like. They didn't have that right in the, in the same monarchical days of the, of the high middle ages. But it is monarchy that is the best system. But even in Canada, were your founders of this parliament working for the reign of Christ the King? I doubt it. That's certainly not the case. So the, the, this, the Western world has been built on sand and it is collapsing. It's falling to pieces. And so now is the time to hold high the Catholic flag, the banner of the reign of Christ the King. And you see in this gospel, some of you might say, well, look, they chased our Lord. They wanted to make him king. And he fled. So he didn't want to be king. So therefore, why are you promoting the kingship of Christ? Well, our Lord, he didn't want to be, pardon the expression, he didn't want to be Burger King. He didn't want to be a materialistic king, which was what the Jews were chasing him for. Because he had fed them 5,000 men, and that means probably about 5,000 women plus children, easily probably 10,000 people. He just fed miraculously. So they chased him, give us more of this bread. Hey, a free welfare state. Christ, let's make you king. Then we don't have to work anymore. We have a free state, a welfare state. That's not what Christ had in mind. And if, he, if Christ was to, to consent to be their Jewish idea of a king, he would never have gone through the passion and never worked the redemption. If they had known he was the king of glory, they would never have crucified him and the redemption would not have taken place. But the kingship of Christ, as Pope Pius XI says, it's firstly over the hearts and minds that love our Lord Jesus Christ, that love His truth, that see the goodness He brings to marriage, to the family, to children, to the society, to all the nation. And we got to recover this vision, this Catholic vision, because the liberal system is, is self-destructive. It is self-suicidal. And just look at, the, look at the obvious, the rate of suicides in the West. Even among teenage children, suicides sky high because they have no clue why they're on earth. They're lost. And many of them from divorced homes with moms and dads with their third or fourth husbands. Poor kids, they're, they're in a whirlwind of madness. And then the public schools teaching them where the girls, where they can get abortions. And giving the children like candy contraceptions and perverting them. I, one of you told me last night that Canada is going to pass a new uh, health education dealing with uh, the sacredness of marriage or the tearing down thereof. And it's so graphic and pornographic that there's even resistance among these liberal ont Canadians. And it's so perverse. We are self-destructing. And that is because, as Cardinal P said, we don't want the kingship of Christ. The Western nations do not want the reign of Christ the King. They do not want the reign of the one true Catholic faith of tradition. And so they got this polit... Everybody has, has their rights, everybody has their religion, everybody has their beliefs, 
and we can all live together in harmony. That's false. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. Indifferentism on matters of religion leads to atheism. And indifferentism on all beliefs leads to a tyranny and dictatorship and the police state, which is what is coming. It is what is coming and well deserved for nations of the West that don't want Christ as king nor his Catholic truth. But for you men, we got to rebuild and we got to start somewhere. So let's convert our minds. Let's study, let's pray, let's do penance. Let's do what we can. And uh, pick up the weapons Our Lady gave us, the great rosary and the scapular. These are not good luck charms. These are weapons, and they're blessed by the church. <coughs> Let me just conclude with the very fact Archbishop Lefebvre understood this very well. And that's why he said, our first fight is for the reign of Christ the King. And he was just quoting all the popes of tradition. And Pope Pius XII said, the solution between all nations for peace is what? He said, all these ridiculous uh, uh, contracts and, and uh, United Nations treaties, absolutely not. What is the foundation of unity among nations and among families and among states or, or provinces? Pius XII said, just repeating Pius XI and Pius X, it's the Holy Eucharist. The sacrifice of the Mass and the heart of Jesus and the Holy Eucharist. The heart of God who so loves us and that love we are to live. That's the rock of unity. Not some fantasy. It's very concrete. The Holy Eucharist is very concrete. He's going to become present in this Mass and you're going to receive the living heart of Jesus, the glorified body of Jesus, to transform you so that you go. The priest says at the end of the Mass, Ite Misa Est, get out there and convert this world to Christ the King. That's what it means. Ite, go, get out of here and go convert souls Bring them in to my sacred heart, who I died for. Now, <clears throat> there's been a big shift in the Society of Pius X, the new SSPX since 2012, since the Vatican II within the society. No longer is the goal to, to work and fight for the social kingship of Christ, and therefore the Mass and sacraments, and therefore combat against Vatican II and the modernist popes, but now the new shift is the Mass. Now that sounds nice, but not in the fight we're in. Bishop Fillet, he said this December 6, 2013. He said, in this climate of confusion, we must restore the Church through the Mass. The primary concern of the Society of St. Pius X is what really keeps the church alive, the Mass. The restoration of the church must start there. Well, that's what St. Peter's is saying. That's what Campos is now saying. That's what all these liberal groups are now saying. They turn the focus from Christ, doctrine, to the Mass. But if you don't have the right doctrine, you don't have the right Mass. Uh, <clears throat> This is Bishop Tissier de Malare. He said this about Summorum Pontificum, which Bishop Follet so highly praised. He praised and thanked Pope Benedict, remember? And he praised the prophetic wisdom recently of, of this wolf, of this modernist. And it misleads the society and traditional Catholic. It misleads them to think that this Pope hey, is he's good after all. He's not good. And he, why is he not good? We, we, we don't know his heart and his mind, God knows, but what he says and thinks is completely heretical and modernist. Bishop Tissier, <clears throat> the conciliar hierarchy's malice is achieved through the use of lies and ambiguity. 
Thus, Pope Benedict XVI's motu proprio, so highly praised by so many society priests, declaring that the traditional Mass had never been abrogated and that its celebration is free, coupled this liberty with conditions. All right, here's the clam, here's the deception, the conditions. Contrary to it, and goes on to qualify the authentic Mass in its modernist counterfeit as the forms extraordinary and ordinary of the same Roman rite. In other words, they play games with the true Mass. He put it on an equal level with the new Mass. And, and any priest who has, uses this right to say the Tridentine Mass, he has to completely accept the legitimacy of the new Mass and the validity of all the new sacraments. And that's what the Pope, that's what, excuse me, Pope, that's what Bishop Follet has done. He has accepted the new Mass as legitimate and all the new sacraments as valid. He's never, he's never uh, condemned that. He's never denounced that. And once you do that, you've already, you've already slid into modernism. You've already lost the fight. You've already lost the vision. And so we must continue, dear faithful. And let me close with the great, great words of our, our dear founder, Archbishop Lefebvre. That's what makes our opposition to current Rome, and that's why we cannot get along. This is not primarily the issue of the Mass, Archbishop Lefebvre, because the Mass is just one consequence of the fact that they wanted to get closer to Protestantism and thus transform worship, sacraments, catechism, etc. The real fundamental opposition is the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what they hate. This is what they are fighting. This is what the Freemasons have, have been fighting ever since they began. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve. This is Satan's plan to, to destroy the kingship of Christ. He must reign, says St. Paul. Our Lord came to rule. They, the modernists in Rome, they say no. And we, we say yes with all the popes of tradition. And then uh, the last quote. Archbishop Lefebvre did not see any possible reconciliation with the modernist Roman authorities as long as they have not recrowned our Lord. So why is Bishop Follet meeting with these rats? Why didn't he say to Cardinal Mueller when he met with him last, last fall, why didn't he say to him, do you believe in the virginity of Mary? Do you believe in the holy transubstantiation? If you don't believe these simple truths, why are we discussing? He knows he doesn't believe in the virginity of Mary. Everybody knows that. He publicly announced that and tried to backtrack with some fuzzy words. But you don't deal with these wolves. And this is what Archbishop Lefebvre, here's his last quote, and I'll close with this. It is not surprising that we have not come to an understanding with Rome. That will not be possible as long as Rome does not return to the faith in the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are in opposition on a point of the Catholic faith. It's not, it's not some question of incense or vestments. It's a question of the very Catholic faith at stake here that we're defending. When they ask us the question of when there will be an agreement with Rome, and don't be deceived, dear people, don't be deceived. The agreement's already done. The agreement is done. What is the agreement? It's the doctrinal declaration of 2012. That's the 30 pieces of, of silver that had to be paid. Everything else is secondary. Once you cave in on doctrine, you've caved in. That's it. When they ask us the question of when there will be an agreement with Rome, my answer is simple. When Rome recrowns our Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot agree with those who uncrown our Lord. The day when they recognize again our Lord as King of all people and nations, they will not be rejoining us, but the Catholic Church in which we have remained.
Father Fluger, listen to these words, Father Fluger. Because you say the SSPX is now abnormal. That it's outside the church. That we're in an abnormal situation. We're not. We've never left the church. We profess the faith of all time. It's not we who have to come back to the church. It's the modernists and the Pope himself who has to come back to the Catholic faith. And he's using his papal authority to smash the Catholic faith. He has no right to do that. And as Catholics, we have to oppose and pray for this Pope for his conversion, Pope Francis, and all the rats around him. And more than rats. They're, a lot of them are perverts, and they're happy to say so. And that's why they're pushing these uh, sodomite laws and not fighting them in the, throughout the world because they themselves are, are infected with it. So, dear faithful, we, we must battle on with the sword in one hand and the trowel in the other. And let's consecrate all we, all we do, all we are, all our families, all your, your work, your duties of state, your businesses, consecrated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Because through her will come, at last, the victory. And even if the victory on earth is short-lived, the big victory is what really counts for all of us, which is to get to heaven to see the face of the Blessed Trinity. O Mary, conceived without sin, O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us, O Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us, In the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen.